14 years ago, when the concept of the Israel Tennis Centers was born, I don't think any of us ever envisaged the ramifications or where we would have reached today. The idea behind the tennis centers was to build recreational facilities because there's no normalcy here. Social and political tension is constant. Many Israelis were leaving. We were worried about the future. We knew that we had to create something for children in Israel to improve their quality of life here. It's certainly been a tremendous success, a dream come true. twice a year in 1969. And at that time, I had played a little bit of tennis. Uh, it was no great interest of mine. And uh, although I was on the Young Leadership Cabinet, uh, spending that much time there, I wondered what I could do more than what we just did as a group. And I realized also that many of my friends that I was teaching were leaving Israel. It was a tough country in which to live. So I thought maybe I could do something through children. I couldn't have do something to affect the whole country. I'm one person. So I gathered five other guys and we decided together to build a tennis center where we would have Davis Cup, which had never won a match, playing on one court, and then little kids of all age groups on the other five courts. We were gonna build six courts. Uh, I started really fundraising before we even put a shovel in the ground. And I was able to fundraise because of young Jewish leadership in each city I called my friends that I had known through, through the cabinet, through Young Jewish Leadership, told them about my idea. I said, will you have, find a tennis court in your locality? Uh, I will come there with some, some of the older players that had been developed in Israel who were 18 and 20, and we'll tell about our project and see if we can raise some money. So by 1976, we opened our first facility at Ramada Sharon. We opened with not six courts, but 26 courts, because there had been a tremendous reception to our idea. Our first hit was between a 91-year-old man and a six-year-old girl, showing the lifespan of tennis. Um, I never, people say that uh, Bill Lippi had this great vision. That was my vision. I never dreamed we'd have 14 centers and we would have 21,000 children there a week. I never, never dreamed it. In addition, it was not my ambition, the first to raise, you know, great players internationally. I mean, it would be like uh, uh, starting a program in Cleveland uh, and the Cleveland at that time with its surrounding territory was almost as big as Israel to think it could develop world champions. And by now, we have programs for the uh, mentally challenged, physically challenged, autistic kids, wheelchair children, children at risk, an Arab-Israeli coexistence program, incorporation of the Falashans, the Ethiopians. We have programs for everything you can think of in depth, in depth, in depth. And at the same time, we are now in the top 16 in the world in Davis Cup, and we were just in the top eight in the world in Federation Cup, this tiny little country with no governmental help. England pays $200 million a year toward their program, for example. And we have this tiny little organization uh, 
tiny little country with this small organization throughout the world that works to raise funds. Um, Sandra was probably the second best thing that ever happened to the tennis centers because uh, at least 30 years ago, she became extremely interested. Uh, she has been the president of the American group. She has been the only international women's chairperson. She is now the head of fundraising globally. I'm telling you that now I, I, she's got to average six hours every day of the week. In the past six weeks, she's been in California twice, New York once. She's going back to New York, back to California. Uh, uh, just she puts, puts in an enormous amount of work, much more than I do now. At the present time, she's working much harder than I, maybe much harder than I ever did. She's organized, she's fanatical about it, and we both get the same pleasure out of it. In the beginning, I guess, I went to meetings pretty much and just sat there as Mrs. Lippy, Sandra, and then all of a sudden I said something one day at a board meeting and made a suggestion that they do a strategic plan and that was the beginning of the end for me. I was sunk and in and chairing it. I met Sandra at the first board meeting I went to in Palm Springs, California. I came all by myself, wandered into a room of people having a cocktail hour and Sandra was the first one that came up to me and introduced herself. It was, it was an, an incredible time that we had that evening and we've been partners in the Israel Tennis Center ever since. Sandra is, was certainly a leader and I recognized that and I knew that her passion for Israel, her passion for the tennis centers, her passion for the children was so well known and I just enjoyed being around her when she was so excited about all the projects that she was involved in. And I knew as a leader, she was always going to rise to the top. Sandra's leadership and, and goals with the Tennis Center when she was chair were all met. She was just wonderful with all the children, the staff. Everybody just loves Sandra. And she has made an impact on this organization that will last forever. Do you think she is a good fundraiser? Do you think she's as good a fundraiser as her husband, Bill? Well, I was a little surprised when I was the only one on her list to be solicited on this last trip and uh, I think she was pretty successful and she's a great fundraiser and uh, needless to say I've always felt very comfortable giving Sandra my money. Uh, Bill uh, approached me the way he approaches uh, uh, everybody in, in fundraising actually and uh, he started to go uh, around, the, around the bushes to see whether I'm going to be involved in the tennis centers or not. Obviously, like he convinces everybody, he convinced, us, convinced me as well. And uh, he asked me to participate and uh, to, uh, to give and to, and to uh, uh, it's not to donate, but uh, to, to help the centers at the time, in the 80s yet, uh, regarding uh, using my experience in uh, management and, uh, and uh, my entire knowledge. So I became a, a friend of the tennis centers and my first program was uh, the new uh, Russian Aliyah and I was in charge of that program which uh, as you probably know thousands of uh, new uh, newcomers kids came and, uh, and uh, uh, participated in the tennis actually straight from the, air, from the airport. We were welcoming in them in the airport and directly to the centers. Through something like tennis to have got kids off the streets, to have watched children integrate, to have given them a lifetime of health, to see the smiles on their faces, to see happy, well-adjusted children. We first met Bill in 1979. It was Pesach, and we were having our usual holiday en famille, when I was advised that uh, there were children from the Israel Tennis Centers arriving at Kassaria to give an exhibition of tennis. And I went along out of idle curiosity to see what was happening. And at the same time, and for the first time, I, meet, I met Dr. Bill Lippi. Now, having seen the children who were 
in the main, they were 10 or 11 years of age, I found it quite remarkable how children of such a, a tender age should play such exciting tennis. And I thought to myself, there must be more behind this story. Well, we went in for tea after having watched the tennis and Bill came over to me and he spoke to me and he asked me if I would be interested in uh, being the leader in, in England in the British team to fundraise for the Israel Tennis Centre. My thoughts were that perhaps we could put this concept of the Israel Tennis Centres together with the problems that existed in Ashkelon and start to improve the situation there. The program is changing the country actually in many, many ways on several levels and even now with what's going on in the news and the terror going on in Israel today, 2014, it's even more important. I think we used to say, well, we're putting, you know, we have this Arab-Jewish program where we put an Arab and a Jew on the court together as partners when they're little tiny kids. We've said it for many years because we've been doing it for many years, but now I think maybe we had no idea how important that was when we first started doing it. So that's one piece of it, but in general it's making kids better, giving them a chance at life, and to achieve the maximum they can. And we have 20,000 kids in the program, so it says a lot about what Bill did. In 1976, opened up his first center, and with him and uh, the five other founders, they did a major service for the country. And I'm happy to be part of it. We've perhaps done our best work in immigrants, in immigration. The Ethiopian immigration has been the toughest. You know, they, no Hebrew, no reading and writing, no education, very old fashioned. The first girls that we got to come to the tennis centers wore skirts down to their ankles. And, and, and a very, just, just no mixing with the general population. We have now a tremendous number of Ethiopian kids playing tennis. We have Ethiopian coaches. We have Ethiopian kids who have come to the tennis centers who now have master's degrees. And I would say that proportion-wise, the number of kids who were lucky enough to come to the tennis centers have made huge strides compared with the rest of the population. And the government has realized that. And for the first time, they've come to us and say, look, if you'll continue to do more Ethiopian programs, we'll contribute. We never went to them. We never want any money from the government. We'll do it ourselves. But maybe we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Look at our Arab coexistence program. Arabs and Jews don't mix in Israel, except at the tennis centers. We have one little girl, one young girl now, Haifa. Started when she was nine, became a good player, became an Israeli champion, got a full scholarship to Duke, to Duke just graduated. She played first position on the tennis team. They finished third in the country. And she's now working for us. She's now working for us in public relations because she says that she got so much out of it. And there's such an opportunity for Jews and Arabs. And she's a Muslim Arab, not a Christian Arab. There's such an opportunity for Jews and Arabs to live and work together. She wants to help toward that end. So whether you take the toughest immigration, the Ethiopians, the toughest mixing, and the Jews and the Arabs, and look how we attack those problems and look what we can do with them. In fact, we've gone so far with the, with the uh, Arab program that in our programs and all our doubles teams, you have to have an Arab and a Jew on each team. So it isn't like the Arabs go over there and the Jews go over there. I think a few things that we didn't anticipate that have been major is the immigration of uh, families from other countries and especially other countries where they don't speak Hebrew at all, most don't, 
uh, and some don't speak English either, like Ethiopia, uh, Russia, um, in particular, I would say. And kids who, who could come into a new setting, a new country, and the parents were a wreck about it, and they could come to the Israel Tennis Center day one and already have a start, a head start on friends and, and um, a meaningful way of spending their days, a safe way um, for these kids. And we've got lots of stories like that with uh, little Devara, who came from Ethiopia, walked across the desert with her whole family and lost many of them on the way. And her family is pretty backward. Um, it was a tough beginning for her, and somehow she found her way to the Israel Tennis Centers. And today, she's college educated, she works for the Israel Tennis Centers, she's a beautiful woman, and uh, she has a life. She has a great life. After uh, conceiving of the idea um, to develop a sport for children, I had to pick the sport, and I was lucky enough to pick tennis, and there were many reasons for that. But then I had to get some help, so I found Ruby Josephs, the builder. Ruby and I played tennis, and he was interested in doing some courts in Haifa. Uh, we talked about doing a project together, and without Ruby, this thing never would happen because Ruby was a builder and uh, Ruby was the toughest man I've ever met. He would fight with everybody for everything, but he always got what he wanted, and what he wanted was always right. Uh, there was uh, Freddie Cravine from London, and he got us started in London. Um, Freddie was a wonderful gentleman and made wonderful contributions during, over the years. But at our first big meeting, after the, we got together and we started to raise some money, we were in Palm Springs, and everybody reported on how much money they had raised. So it came to Freddie, and Freddie, uh, how did you do? And he said, well, he said in his very British accent, he said, I think we're well on our way to a very successful organization. He said, as a matter of fact, Lord Churchill, who is the keeper of the tower, has agreed to serve on our committee. And I said, is he Jewish? And he said, a Jewish keeper of the tower? <laughs> of course not. But that was Freddie's system, and but he did some wonderful things later on. It was Harold Landisberg from Philadelphia, big, handsome guy, wonderful man, who was involved in so many charities. And I remember once we, we had a meeting at Obie's Backgammon Parlor on the 79th Street Causeway at one o'clock in the morning with a, with a guy. We had to wait till he finished back, backgammon at three o'clock. Now, you know how I hate to stay up late. And uh, we finally met and we sat down and he agreed to become a founder for $1,500 in those days. So Harold pulled the pledge card out of his pocket. It was for the Boy Scouts. <laughs> Harold was always soliciting for so many organizations. Then there was Joe Shane, who was just a wonderful, wonderful man, a real Israel file. And, and uh, uh, I met him at the parade, the 25th anniversary of the founding of Israel. And I knew he had an interest. He had done some courts in the north, and, and he was a real, real character. So he was the fifth. And then Ian Froman played tennis, Davis Cup for Israel. He was the captain, very good tennis player. And uh, uh, he had sort of started to work on this project in South Africa. They had put out a, because uh, he's South African, they had put a little brochure, but it never had gone very far. So with the power we had with all of us, uh, we got started. Ian came and lived with me in Ohio. Um, about the summer of 72 or 73. And on weekends, we would go around and start our solicitations. So it started small. 
the people we met along the way, the friends I've made along the way, uh, have been lifelong friends. Uh, men like Peter Collins from London, Ron Steele, my Australian friend who's lived in Israel longer than I have, George Levinson, of course. Um, in the United States, Alan Goldstein, Seymour Bro, we're there right at the beginning. Jerry Cohen, uh, the Bernstein family, the Rosenberg family, Hal Rosenson, Shelley Rabinowitz, the Dykers, my dear friend and crazy friend Dick Savitt, the only Jew to ever won Wimbledon and he wants to replace himself. Larry Greenspawn, Eugene Grants, Kevin Green, Joe Freiberg from Canada. When we first met Joe Freiberg, Ian and I went up, we said, we want to talk to you about a project. And we said, we'd, we'd like you to raise some money for us. And there were a few of them. Joe, Joe Freiberg was there. Uh, the Halberts were there. Um, not sure who else. There were a few of them. And they said, well, we, we might be interested if we have a specific project. How about a Canada Stadium? And I said, wow, that would be great. Can you, can you raise $250,000? I was shaking. And they said, well, we can probably do that. You know, we'll each of us know people and we'll ask them for $25,000 each and we can probably do that. Then Joe said later, we didn't realize we all had the same friends. So it was a little tougher than we thought. The first time I met Bill Liffey, was, uh, Bill called Toronto and asked whether he could come up and talk to us about a project that he was involved in in Israel. And we said, certainly, Bill, you're welcome to come up. None of us knew him, but we knew that he was a surgeon in Warren, Ohio. And Bill came up and we gathered a few guys together just to hear what he had to say. And Bill told us about the wonderful program of the Israel Tennis Center and the dream that they had of creating this fantastic center for children in Israel. And uh, we listened to what he had to say. And then uh, we asked him, we said, well, now that we've heard what you're doing, what is it that you would like us to do? And you know, this young man sort of, he gulped a little bit and he was a little shy and he said, well, do you think? You know, he was very naive at that time as far as fundraising was concerned. And he said, well, could you possibly think that maybe Canada could raise $50,000? And we all looked at him and we thought, well, you know, let's think about this for a minute. We asked him to leave the room and we called him back in and we said, Bill, we're sorry. We can't raise $50,000. We've decided that we're going to give you $250,000. Well, this Bill was astounded, of course. And what can I tell you that it's, now, this was in 77. Here we are. Canada's contributed over $24 million because a lot of this is due to Bill Lippy, his leadership. Uh, he's, his enthusiasm is contagious, and uh, he's just been an inspiration for us in Canada. He's come up so many times. He's helped us fundraise. He's spoken, and he's just a fantastic individual. And Joe, you know, was international chairman, followed by Kevin Green. And Kevin was probably our best chairman ever international chairman. He is so tough and so dedicated and so persistent. He has made some of the changes that were so necessary uh, that went in, became part of our strategic plan. Tommy Bernstein did a lot with the strategic plan and we're certainly on the right track. This year, in 2012, we're going to have our, we will have had our greatest fundraising year in the last decade where you know things went down and down and down and in 2008 like this slowly up but this is the best year we've had in a decade and I'd like to say that not only do we think a lot of the tennis centers but the Israelis think a lot of it twice we won the Israel prize for the best organization in Israel in sociology not in tennis but in sociology and right now, 60% of the budget comes from Israel. The Israelis themselves, who for many years were not 
have not been good givers, have become good givers to the Israel Tennis Centers because I think they realize the value. It's wonderful to see. These have been lifetime friends and my best friends, my best friends by far. So, and Sandra's best friends. So our, much of our social life revolves around this group of, of friends. I was there when we built the first tennis center. And I was there when we built the stadium and opened the first, and opened the first tennis center. And my thoughts then were directed at where will we open next? And I was there for all 14 openings. And I never cried because I never felt that the job was done. You know, when you take a big position with a company or a business or a philanthropic organization, that's when you really figure out what's going on and, and what it's all about and, and what has to be done. And you have a chance to make a difference, a little one. So I was campaign chair for national, the national board and then they invited me to be the international chairman, first and only woman so far. And um, now I'm the global resource development chair, which is really means I'm in charge of fundraising. It's growing. It's definitely growing. And one of our graduates who, because of the tennis centers, had a full scholarship to university in, in the States here, has now, with lots of business experience, moved back to Israel and is now going to be the new upcoming CEO. So it's a real big circle, wonderful circle of success. When you do good things, it comes back in spades. Let's not talk now about what we've done for the tennis centers, but what they've done for us. It's something that Sandra and I do together. It's something we all do together. All our kids, all of you kids play tennis. It's, it's a real, become a real family thing. All you kids are involved in the tennis centers. You're all involved. Our whole family's been very, very wrapped around the Israel Tennis Centers. All the, all the boys have been to Israel and been at the tennis centers over the years and know what its importance is. David has been on the national board and really uh, did a great deal for, for our board and the, and the organization in the arena of marketing. And, um, our grandson Harrison was just there, spent a week there last summer and we were so happy that he was able to do that and see what he's heard about all these years. It's one thing for a 15 year old to hear about it, but then when they experience it, they really say, must say to themselves, I hope, you know, wow, this is something I think is great. And it's my grandparents, especially his Saba. And hopefully that'll play a role in his life and everyone in our family who goes to Israel and sees what Bill created there, that it will, it will impact their hearts and understanding of what you need to do as a, as a human being, is to try your best to help others and make the world just a little bit better. Do you know what the, the feeling is like uh, for Israel to celebrate something? You know, they celebrated the War of Independence. There was, I guess they celebrated in 67. Uh, in 72, there wasn't much of a celebration. 82 in Lebanon, there wasn't much of a celebration. Well, last year, playing in Israel, we had first beaten Peru with the number seven player in the world. Then we beat England, who spends 200 million a year. Then we beat Poland. We beat Russia in Israel. And 
Israel went crazy. It was their probably the biggest celebration since the 1967 war. Do you know the, the emotion that we felt? Do you know the emotion when we started out not even thinking about a champion, just thinking about making the lives of the people better to end up with something like that? So the, the accomplishments have been way beyond our dreams, way beyond our dreams. You'd have to be nuts to think that you could start a program and a little country this like this with no tennis background. Hell, I could have been a, ten a tennis teacher when we started. Now who are, our, who are our pros? They've all played the circuit. They've all played the, the junior circuit or the circuit. Uh, they're all players. And they're the ones that are teaching our kids now. And that's why our kids now are getting better and better and better. So I think it's something that will last forever. And it started with one little facility.